Well, thank, <coughs> thank you very much for that introduction, and I'm sorry I didn't bring a cello to, to, uh, to calm you all down. Uh, I don't have a, a very clear understanding of what it is that you would like to hear me talk about, uh, other than that I was told that you have an interest in development, uh, but that interest in development might lead you to ask questions. And so my thought was to give you a short introduction and then leave it over to you guys to ask such questions as you think might be interesting and would allow me to contribute to uh, your understanding at least of my experience and of uh, what I think is important. One was the career that I wanted to establish, uh, which was a career that I'd hoped would be in the investment banking business and which allowed me to, in fact, <coughs> develop my activities in that field in, in countries other than my native Australia, and uh, to finish up doing work in the middle of the American investment banking community and then starting my own firm before I went off to the World Bank. And so I was able, because of the opportunities <coughs> here, to have first the professional strand and then on the other side to establish for myself a goal which was first to spend 20% of my time and my income and then 30% and ultimately more balancing the life that I was doing between business and non-business activities. And I have to tell you just because as I look at this room and think of my own background that if there's one thing that I would as a generality say to you, it is that if it is possible for you in whatever you're doing to engage yourself in things other than the straight business course, you will find that not only does it enrich your life, uh, but the truth of the matter is that it'll enrich your business because you engage yourself in people and with people in the community that have broader issues uh, with which they're engaged. And they tend to be the best people in the community, the people that have decided that it's not just a singular interest in business, which is the thing that drives them, but that since business does survive within a communal environment, that uh, that aspect of duality in the life is something that I found in my life it was the thing that made it meaningful. But it also gave me the opportunity as a result of activities in the field, particularly not just of the arts, but of development in which I became interested, <coughs> that it took me into that area for which I suppose I'm best known, which was my period at the World Bank and subsequently in the Middle East. But today I would like to focus on the period in the World Bank because it has some messages that I think may be interesting to you and certainly relevant. And if I were your age, I would be thinking very seriously about what it was that drove me to the bank and what it was I learned there. The first thing I'd like to say is that, harking back to my own experience, I grew up in a world in which, for decades, uh, there was a uh, one-sixth of the world by the year 2000, a billion people who had 80% of the world's income. And then there were five billion people who were in the so-called developing world that had 20% of the global income. And I took an interest in that 20% through activities in foundations and other things largely because I couldn't understand how the world would continue in an inequitable distribution of 5 billion having 20% and 1 billion having 80% of the world's GDP. It stuck, stood there in the post-war years with varying numbers, of course, in terms of the global population, but proportionately, that was the sort of relationship, this 80-20, which existed for decades. But came the last decade 
of uh, the last century and moving into this new century, we're seeing for the first time a swing which now has that 80-20 somewhere closer to 70-30 or 72-28 or some such number. And that is an important and rapid change which has occurred. And it's brought about a change which has been very evident in the way in which international institutions function and in which indeed the global economy functions. So much so that as we look out, the so-called 80-20 that I and my contemporaries grew up with is now looking at a very, very different future. It is the future that you will face. It is a future of 9 billion people on the planet by the year 2050. Of the 3 billion extra that have been added to the planet or will be added to the planet from the year 2000, about 100 million goes to the rich countries and 2.9 billion goes to the developing countries. So come 2050, it's not 1 billion and 5 billion, it's 1.1 billion and 8 billion, or close to it. That is a huge change, dramatic change. The other consequential change is that the structure of the economy is being driven both by the population development and also by modern technology which has allowed the conveyance of ideas and innovation to move to the developing world. And so the projections today are that that old 80-20 with which I grew up for decades will become 35-65. 35% for the billion one in the rich countries and 65% for the people in the developing countries. That is turning the world on its head in terms of the world that I grew up in. But it is the world that you're going to work in. And it is not a trivial change. It is a change of monumental importance. So much so that by 2050, China and India, the two countries that I have, uh, of course, the leading countries in the developing world, will constitute 50% of the global GDP. 50% of the global GDP. That is the consensus estimate. But let's say we're off 5%, it's 45% of the global GDP. It's nonetheless a monumental switch in terms of economic power. It happened last in 1815 when China and India were 50% of the global GDP. And it happened before that in the year 1500. And in the period from 1815 at various times it's been approaching that. But with communism and with the change in governance in China and with the greater development in terms of the industrial revolution in the West, you got to a point where after World War II, China and India were together 2% of the global GDP. So the growth in terms of China and India and of Asia generally is such that it is not just some modulation of former trends. It is an absolutely fundamental change in the way the world is balanced. I remember I was at a at a meeting of the G, G7, G8, the first time that the people from the developing world leaders were invited. Seven or eight leaders were invited by Jacques Chirac to a meeting that was held in France. You'd be familiar with the fact that the G7, G8 meet once a year in June or July and generally uh, until recently decide what they think is going to happen with the world and then they might tell a few people outside, well, it changed at that meeting. And I remember that the first person to speak was Hu Jintao from China who made a very elegant speech about China and about the growth and about interdependence between China and the rest of the world. The Prime Minister Bajpai from India then spoke uh, 
I think probably eloquently, but I couldn't understand his English very well, so, so I, 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 I can only assume that it was another brilliant speech. Uh, but then <coughs> President Lula from Brazil got up and said uh, rather charmingly, if only my parents could see me now, I came from a very poor family, and to see myself here with you, <coughs> President Chirac, and with you, the Prime Minister of England, and you, the head of Germany, and you, you detailed the people that were in the room. He didn't mention the president of the World Bank, I want you to know. <laughs> uh, but, 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 but he did mention the other minor people that were there. Uh, and, and then he said, then he said, but I'd like you to consider something, and maybe next year you should have your meeting in Brazil. And the reason you should do that is because you should start getting used to the fact that in another 10 or 12 years, five of you are not going to be here. <laughs> and we, you will be replaced by my friend from China and my friend from India and by myself. And, <laughs> and, and, and we'd like you to get used to it so that you can come see us. Well, it was sort of prescient because, as you know, uh, when the economic crisis hit, very quickly it moved from a G8 issue to a G20 issue. And now the G8 is part of the past, and the G20 is the new institution that is there. And it again fits into the prospective development of which I spoke, which is that the weighting of the planet is now moving in different directions. Uh, until recently, till we had this crisis, the United States had a sort of 10 trillion consumption. European Union had nine. And Asia and the rest of the developing world had a little less than five trillion dollars. So it was 10, nine, five. And the middle class in, in the world, of whom there are today or a couple of years ago was a billion and a half, roughly, in the middle class. A billion was in the rich countries in that, in that group that I spoke of. And uh, about half a billion in the middle class characterizes incomes of between $10, and $100, and $100 uh, per capita uh, uh, per week, uh, that this, this uh, amount of, of money uh, was um, demonstrated to be heavily leveraged to those richer countries. By 2030, the estimate now is that there will be 3 billion people in the middle class, and of that 3 billion, two-thirds of it will be in Asia. Two-thirds of it. 